Thank you for joining us today at Forge Road. Turn with me, if you will, in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 4. We'll be spending some time in chapters 4, 5, and 6 this morning. <clears throat> at daybreak on a bright July morning, the order was given and cannon erupted all across the line of English ships. They were outnumbered and outmanned, but they trusted that the superior range of their guns would wreak havoc on the seven-mile-long line of enemy ships passing in front of them before they themselves would come under fire. In this, they were only partially correct. The English were able to thin the ranks of the fleet passing them, but could not stop the advance. Several days later, that opposing force, known down through history as the Spanish Armada, anchored in an exposed position off of Calais, France. The Spanish at the time were the world's only superpower and were led by Catholic King Philip II. To the north of Spain lay Protestant England, then ruled by Queen Elizabeth I. Philip was particularly angry at the spread of Protestantism in England and sought to subdue it and restore the Roman church to its rightful place there. Moreover, having England as a vassal state controlled by Spain would add nicely to his dominion. And so the Armada departed Lisbon on May 28, 1588, with orders to rendezvous with and board the Spanish army at Calais, France, then cross the English Channel and invade England. Spain had reason to be confident. The Armada consisted of 130 ships carrying 2,500 pieces of artillery, 8,000 seamen, and almost 20,000 soldiers. England had nothing able to withstand such a force, and its rapid capitulation was assured. But while the Spanish were anchored off of Calais, the English sent fire ships into the midst of the densely packed Spaniards panicking the Spanish sailors and forcing them out into the channel and away from each other. Then began a seven-day sea battle with both sides launching attacks. Ultimately, the English ran out of ammunition and the weather was worsening, so they withdrew. On July 29th, the Spanish commander decided to regroup his fleet to the north and into the North Sea. This would prove to be a colossal error. As they rounded the north of Scotland, a strong southwest wind prevented them from sailing back southeast and into the English Channel. Once blown to the west of Scotland and Ireland, they experienced some of the worst weather ever to have hit the region, and it had a catastrophic effect on the Armada. Some 50 or so ships were lost, either dashed onto the rocks of Ireland and Scotland or foundering at sea, and many of the surviving ships were barely seaworthy afterwards. By the time the remains of the Armada limped back to Spain that October, over half the fleet had been lost, and some 15,000 men had perished. Those that survived were half-starved, diseased, and traumatized by the disastrous voyage home and had ceased to be an effective fighting force. The Armada would never sail again, its commander declaring that he would rather lose his head than ever return to sea. While the English had a legitimate claim to victory off of Calais, given their much weaker force, for the most part, the Armada succumbed to the weather. Because of the implications the loss of his fleet had on King Philip's ambitions concerning Catholicism in England, the wind that drove the Spaniards west of Scotland came to be known as the Protestant wind. More than anything else, the weather that summer and fall, under the control, of course, of the Almighty, defeated the Armada. Popular coins circulated afterwards in England saying, man proposes but God disposes, and citing Job 4, by the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of his anger they are consumed. It's not a stretch to say that had the battle gone the other way, 
we might all be speaking Spanish here this morning. The hand of the Almighty in the affairs of men. Our text this morning concerns events which also display the hand of the Almighty in the affairs of men. This time, those of the Israelites and the Philistines. But before we open the scriptures, let's commit our time here to the Lord. Father, we ask your blessing on our time here this morning. Only you can give us understanding of your word. Only you can fill our hearts with peace. Take us where you will this morning. And we'll give you all the glory. Amen. We continue in our series on the life of Samuel and find ourselves in a curious place. Because in this morning's study... Samuel is completely absent. He's not mentioned at all in the text before us, despite the passage being a part of the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. But no matter, in all these sermons of the series, indeed in every sermon faithfully taken from the Bible, the main character is the Lord God. And in our passage this morning, we have abundant evidence of him. The scene opens in chapter 4 with the Israelites at war with their frequent opponents, the Philistines. The narration is silent as to the reason for the war, but whatever it was, Israel and the Philistines clashed at a place called Ebenezer. And the takeaway for our purposes is that Israel got whooped. Not your average beat down, but somewhat of a thrashing, losing 4,000 men in the battle. And the elders of the people wondered why the Lord had turned against them. To their credit, the elders recognized that they were defeated at the hand of Jehovah, not at the Philistines' hand. But the general wickedness of Israel seems to have escaped their attention. We heard last week how Eli's sons, the priests, Hophni and Phinehas, had turned the tabernacle into a brothel, a place where sin was not confessed but committed. The narrator in chapter 2, verse 12, called them worthless men. This then was the spiritual state of Israel. How could the elders not have remembered that their covenant with Jehovah was a two-way street? That Moses' warnings of the penalties of disobedience outlined in Deuteronomy 28 were not idle threats. Nevertheless... The elders, looking to avoid a repetition of the earlier defeat, have an idea. Let's take the Ark of the Covenant, Ark of the Covenant with us into battle next time. You can just hear them get excited at the prospect. A replay of the heady days of Joshua when the Ark was part of the long column of Israelites as they circled the walls of Jericho. Or when the waters of the Jordan parted to allow the nation to cross with dry feet. With the Ark of the Covenant in our midst, we cannot be defeated. And here, in that attitude, we see a glimpse of why they had been defeated in the first place. They were all about the form of religion without the substance. Israel was a wicked people just then. It tolerated wicked priests who desecrated sacrifices to God. Religion had been reduced to form without substance. God's people had, in fact, abandoned God by their actions, if not by their words. There were yet another example of people who discard the essence of religion, but cling to the rituals and external observances of it. The ark was but a token of God's presence. It it pointed to God. It was not in itself a thing to be worshipped. It was not in itself able to bring victory or anything else. There are many who have suggested that the elders of Israel were merely considering the ark as some sort of a good luck charm or a, a rabbit's foot one keeps in one's pocket to ensure good luck. But with all due respect, I don't think they were thinking that. Here's why. They had just suffered a great loss which had cost them 4,000 men. These were 
sons and fathers and friends who were irreplaceable. And another battle loomed in which they could lose many thousands more. In 21st century America, reading a story on a page describing an event from centuries ago, it's perhaps easy for us to underestimate the stakes here for the participants. It's easy to minimize the fear that would have accompanied these discussions among the elders. So their sin, I believe, was much worse than merely using the ark as a talisman or a good luck charm. It was an attempt to coerce Jehovah. Note the elders' careful characterization of the ark. In just about all of 1 and 2 Samuel, the ark is referred to variously as the ark of God or the ark of the God of Israel or the ark of the Lord. But here in verse 3, the elders specifically call it the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as if to remind God of his obligations to his people, as if to say, God, you are honor-bound covenant obligated to bring victory to us in this battle. Letting your people be defeated will be a direct reflection on your character and will diminish your glory. Can there be a more audacious threat? But the narrator of the story sidesteps that discourtesy and hints at the overall theme of the lesson, reporting in verse 4 that the people sent to Shiloh and brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts who is enthroned on the cherubim. Do you see the distinction the narrator makes? Not only is Jehovah the God of Israel, he's the Lord of Hosts. Not a mere territorial God with geographic limits on its power, but one who has all authority in every place and in every time and who will himself decide how his glory will be manifested in the earth. It's not just Israel's God. And it is this God whom the elders of Israel rudely remind of his obligations to his people. As we shall see, Jehovah will not be coerced. And so Hophni and Phinehas, the wicked priests, take the ark from Shiloh, it would never return there, and carry it to the camp where the army of Israel prepares for the upcoming battle. When it arrived, the narrator writes, all Israel gave a mighty shout so that the earth resounded. In fact, the noise is so loud that the Philistines hear it over in, the, in their camp and wonder what all the commotion is about. They make it their business to find out. The presence of the ark in Israel's camp worries them a great deal. They remind themselves what Israel's God had done to the Egyptians during the Exodus. They resolve to fight even harder. Perhaps they can overcome Israel's God. When the battle occurs, Israel is defeated again, losing the ark and also 30,000 soldiers. Now comes the tale of the sad tidings the messenger back from the battle has for the city of Shiloh. Israel has suffered a defeat ten times worse than the earlier one. Eli's frat family practically gets wiped out from the defeat and its aftermath. And the judgment on the nation as a whole continues. The Philistines were triumphant. And the army of Israel was thrashed into non-existence. The narrator reporting that they fled every man to his home. Not an honorable defeat, but a humiliation. Psalm 78 is a long recounting of God's dealings with his stubborn people, beginning in the Exodus and extending all the way to the reign of David. Asaph, the psalmist, wrote the following about what happened on this day. When God heard, he was full of wrath, and he utterly rejected Israel. He forsook his dwelling at Shiloh, the tent where he dwelt among mankind, and delivered his power to captivity, his glory to the hand of the foe. He gave his people over to the sword and vented his wrath on his heritage. This was judgment on Israel from beginning to end. 
Far from any notion that the ark being taken from Shiloh was against his will, its journey over the next several months was a foreordained lesson aimed both at the Israelites and at the Philistines. The Philistines, of course, are jubilant over their victory and carry the ark off into their country. This, though, will be the high watermark of, their, of the Philistines' experiences with the ark because it is all downhill from here. By absconding with the ark, the Philistines volunteer to participate in an object lesson concerning power, specifically the power of Jehovah versus the power of Dagon, which is the Philistines' god. They placed the ark in the temple of Dagon, one of the many gods whom ancient peoples worshipped, each thought to have power within a specific geographic territory and for a specific people. Thus, the Canaanites worshipped Baal, the Ammonites worshipped Moloch, the Moabites worshipped Chemosh, the Assyrians worshipped Asher, and the Philistines worshipped Dagon. The placement of the ark within Dagon's temple is an attempt by the Philistines to underscore the downfall of Jehovah. Here, Jehovah, within our borders, you have no power or authority. Dagon is preeminent in this place. Here, you're subservient to Dagon, who defeated you in battle. Your defeat yesterday is proof of your powerlessness. Now comes your humiliation forevermore. But Jehovah has other plans. Here's more from Psalm 78. Then the Lord awoke as from sleep, like a strong man shouting because of wine. And he put his adversaries to rout. He put them to everlasting shame. Jehovah will not be mocked. Imagine the surprise of Dagon's priests the next morning when they arrive at the temple to discover that the statue of Dagon is lying face down on the ground before the ark. Huh? They reinstall the statue on its perch that day, but are shocked the following morning when they to find Dagon yet again on his face in the dirt, only this time both his head and his hands had been severed off. Can you imagine the chill that went up the priest's spines? This is far worse than yesterday morning. How, how are we to fix this? And that ark. Just sitting there. It turns out that eastern peoples frequently cut off the heads and hands of defeated foes. And they considered their gods an extension of the nation. That's why it was such a coup for the Philistines to have captured the ark in the first place. In a sense, that capture made the victory complete. A final humiliation for the Israelites. Their god taken prisoner. And as a result, the very soul of their nation stripped of its power and its ability to continue resistance. But now we begin to see that the victory might not have has been as complete as they had first thought. For Dagon to lose his head and hands before the Ark of Jehovah meant that Jehovah had conquered Dagon, not the other way around. And more than that, it happened in a territory over which Dagon was supposed to be sovereign. It dawns on the Philistines that Jehovah is no mere tribal territory, territorial deity, but is free to act and conquer anywhere in the world. And their train wreck of keeping the ark as a spoil of war is just getting underway. Jehovah is just getting started. The Philistines occupied a territory comprised of five cities which lie to the west of Judah between it and the Mediterranean Sea. They brought the ark to the city of Ashdod, the farthest away from Judah, which was where the temple of Dagon was situated. The arrival of the sacred chest 
turned out to be a very bad turn of events for the citizens of Ashdod because soon after Dagon's literal downfall, they started to be afflicted with what the narrator calls tumors. We're not told more than that, and various scholars over the years have speculated as to the nature of these tumors. The King James Version translates the word emeralds, which is an Old English word for hemorrhoids, and adds the clarification in their secret parts. But that phrase is completely absent in the original Hebrew, so that just confuses the issue. I doubt that that is what that, that these tumors were, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. The Hebrew word means swellings of some sort. But it's not that important for us to know the precise medical condition here. The more interesting thing to observe is the reaction of the men of Ashdod. In verse 7 we find, And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. His Ashdod leader sized up the situation and decided they'd had enough. They want no part of the ark now. Observe that there's no appeal to Dagon here. Dagon isn't on their solutions list, lying as he was, decapitated and Humpty Dumpty-like on the ground. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Dagon back together again. The men of the city consider their god Dagon a victim in the same class that they were, targets of an angry god of Israel. Thus, they decide that the way out of this mess is to get the ark as far away from them as possible, or at least out of town. They call a meeting of the lords of the Philistines, that is, the heads of the five cities of the people, and they ask, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? Now, I would like to have been a fly on the wall in that meeting so I could hear the answer to what was undoubtedly the next question. What's the problem with where it is now? Because if the men of Ashdod are honest, they would have to reply that they believe the ark's presence in their town was making their people very ill. And what city would want the ark then? But the narrator hasn't given us that level of detail about this conversation. They answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. The men of Ashdod breathe a sigh of relief. And they begin this game of hot potato by tossing the hot property to the city of Gath. No doubt the leaders of Gath have no idea what they're in for. Soon they realized their mistake. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic, and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. The panic is a new development. Perhaps word of the widespread problems in Ashdod had gotten around in Gath, and the people there put two and two together. Jehovah seems to be escalating the pressure on the Philistines. Every, every city suffers from what the previous city suffered from, and then some. Soon, the leaders of Gath cry uncle, and they sent the ark to Ekron. The people of Ekron, however, object right away. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, they have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. News travels fast, even at that age, with no mass communication. Ekron was not to be spared the wrath of Jehovah. And the narrator notes that the hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Can you just hear the desperation in that city? We read between the lines and we see wretchedness and hopelessness. Again, our reading this on clean white pages in our comfortable chairs centuries later can easily cause us to gloss over the misery that this plague spawned. But what I suspect was occurring on the streets of Ekron was wide-eyed panic. 
one day things are humming along. And, and then this? What did we do to deserve this? The seriousness of the illness is one of the reasons I doubt that hemorrhoids were what afflicted the Philistines. Many observers of this passage have noticed the references to rodents in the next chapter and the tumors in this chapter and concluded that the affliction of, on the cities was actually bubonic plague, the same black death that wiped out 60% of Europe's population later in the 14th century. We now know that rats and unsanitary conditions fostered the spread of that pestilence. Of course, Jehovah is not limited in his options for afflicting the Philistines. He may have used something else. But, but the impact on the populace is unmistakable. It's beginning to look like the Philistines might have won the war, but will lose the peace. They carried off the ark, but now very much regret that they did so. The question now is, who is in the grip of whom? Note that the God of Israel is not relying on the people of Israel to preserve and defend his honor. They had abdicated that role prior to the battle having started, and now a defeated and distant people were completely on the sidelines. But Jehovah doesn't need them for his defense. There's an old saying that one plus God is a majority. But this is actually incorrect. God is a majority himself, no matter who might be on, the either, on either side. The Philistines are discovering that again and again. After the Ekron debacle, they have finally had enough and surrender to the Ark of God. They need to get this chest out of their land and as soon as possible. The leaders are not foolish enough to assume that now merely giving the Ark back to Israel will atone for their sin of stealing it. So they ask their holy men how they should give it back. They said, if you send away the ark of the God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return him a guilt offering. Then you will be healed, and it will be known to you why his hand does not turn away from you. The Philistine priests responded by prescribing a pagan offering to Jehovah. They were correct in perceiving that propitiation was a necessary part of placating God. Propitiation means appeasing God through some means, uh, some action or sacrifice that mollifies Him. And pagan religions were all about sacrifice to please their gods. In this instance, the priests supposed that a golden recreation of the specific afflictions visited upon them, which is to say tumors and mice, would demonstrate to Jehovah that they understood his punishment was as a result of their kidnapping the ark. In other words, message understood, and here is our guilt offering showing our repentance. No place in Scripture does God accept gold as a sacrifice. Blood runs through the sacrificial system instituted by God in Israel. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, we read in Hebrews. Philistine, so one thing we know for certain, Philistine priests had no Israelite defectors among them. No one even vaguely familiar with authentic worship of Jehovah would have suggested golden images as a guilt offering. But the narrator doesn't comment at all on that, and except, on the offering, except to describe the objects and pass on the fact that there was one for each Philistine city. The priests go further in arguing what should be done. Why should you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? After he had dealt severely with them, did they not send the people away and they departed? Given the misery exhibited by the people in Ekron, it, it seems odd that the priests felt they had to encourage the Philistine powers that be not to harden their hearts over releasing the ark. Perhaps the leaders of the two cities which did not house the ark were waffling in their resolve to let the thing go. 
for their part, the priests probably wanted to get about the business of repairing Dagon, and that was likely impossible in the midst of a plague. In any event, the leaders agreed to their plan. And a curious plan it was. They specified that the ark be placed on a brand new cart, which was to be pulled by two cows, which had nursing calves and which had never been yoked. Further, the calves were to be taken home away from them. Now, I'm no expert on cattle, but I'm reliably informed that there are a couple of things about cows that make this plan ripe for failure. First, cows who are new mothers will want to be with their young more than anything. Separate them from their calves, and they will attempt to find them first thing. Second, cows have to be trained to efficiently pull together on a yoke. Obviously, training isn't happen, happening here. But the plan has even less chance of success given the next provision. If the cows pulled the cart straight back to Beth Shemesh, unguided by anyone, that would be proof that the Lord God of Israel had his hand in all of this. If the cows do not pull the cart there, then we know that all this has merely been a coincidence. The distance from Ekron to Beth Shemesh was about seven miles, mostly uphill. The unwilling, untrained cows pulling that cart uphill to a place they'd never been would be a, a miracle of, of biblical proportions. The narration is understated, but as it is many times in Scripture, but I can't help but be reminded here of the contest between Elijah and the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. There, after the priests of Baal had labored all morning to get him to try and torch their altar, Elijah had his altar doused with 12 large jars of water, making it seemingly impossible that it would burst into flame. And yet it did by the hand of Jehovah, the fire even consuming the altar of Baal some distance away. The improbabilities of this cart ride remind me of that. So the Philistine lords do as the priests had suggested and outfit the cart and cattle for the journey. The men did so and took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of the Lord on the cart and the box with the golden mice and the images of their tumors. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. I can't decide whether the lords of the Philistines followed them out of the sheer wonder of this miracle happening before their very eyes or whether they just wanted to ensure that the ark got out of their territory unhampered. Probably a little of both. But look at that nation later. They continued in their unrepentant, idolatrous ways. In this sense, they are a direct parallel to the Egyptians, who also tasted the wrath of God in an up-close and personal way. How quickly they forgot. How quickly we forget. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And when they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark, they rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stopped there. A great stone was there. And they split up the wood of the cart and offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. Now we have a proper sacrifice, one that is consistent with the prescribed worship of Jehovah. And yet, the lesson for the Israelites was not yet over. And he struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh, because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them, and the people mourned, because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Most English translations render the crime here as men looking into the ark, which appears to be more accurate than the ESV quoted here. And the number of the men who died is a little confusing. Most 
but not all Hebrew manuscripts, reading literally 70 men, comma, 50,000 men. As the village of Beth Shemesh did not have that sort of population, the meaning of that phrase, if original, is uncertain. One thing that should be obvious to us is that they didn't die immediately. If men dropped as soon as they looked into the ark, others would not have followed suit. So these men must have died over the next few hours or days. But why was Jehovah's hand against them? The Israelites had God's written law, and that decreed that no one should even look upon the ark except the high priest, and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. The regulations are all laid out on Numbers 4. Was there a different standard for the Israelites than for the Philistines? It appears so. The Philistines enduring their own lessons on ark etiquette just prior. Then the men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? And to whom shall he go up away from us? Sadly, this sounds a lot like the response from the people of Ashdod. This ark is too much for our town. We cannot safely keep it. Someone take it away. One would expect such a response from the pagan neighbors of Israel. But it's tragic for the Israelites themselves not to know how to treat it. If they've fallen so far a way that they did not remember what Moses wrote. What is worse? Beth Shemesh was one of the 48 cities in Israel allotted to the Levites. Here's where the tribe supplying priests to the nation was to live and to thrive. How is it then possible that no one in town knew how the ark was to be treated? It's yet another symptom of why Jehovah had defeated them before the ark was captured. The nation had abandoned its covenant. And so the men of Beth Shemesh sent word to Kiriath Jerim, which is a larger town to the east, to come and fetch the ark. And that was done. We'll leave the, the story of the ark there for this morning. And some may wonder why this is at all relevant to us in 21st century Baltimore. After all, these events took place 3,000 years ago, and it impacted peoples with little in common with us. Why rehash old tales? Where's the profit in them? The underlying premise of the answer is that this God, Jehovah, is unchanging. If that were not true, I would argue that this passage is no more relevant to us than the Odyssey or the Iliad by the ancient Greek poet Homer. Interesting literature, but no more than that. But if God is unchanging, the entire substance of the passage explodes with relevance to us. Here's a God who is sovereign in every place and time. Here's a God who will not be coerced even by his chosen people. Here's a God who is self-sufficient and able to bring the mighty to their knees. Here's a God who rains down punishments on those who violate his commandments. Here is a God who uses even cattle to demonstrate that his decree shall stand. Here is Jehovah, the great I Am. Yes, an unchanging God forces our cynical 21st century minds to consider the attributes of God revealed in this story. Because those attributes are ones we also face. Holiness, omnipotence, righteousness, purity, supremacy, sovereignty. All of a sudden, this is not an academic exercise, but a glimpse into our present and into our future. A glimpse of him who is and ever shall be. 
If we truly grasp the magnitude of his glory and majesty, my friends, we would not be sitting in chairs here this morning, would be, would be on our faces before him as Dagon was. And the distance between us and the ancient peoples is closer than we might assume. The sinfulness of the Israelites mirrors our sinfulness today. The arrogance of the Philistines mirrors our arrogance today. But God is not thwarted or set back. His counsel shall stand. The story is shot through with illustrations of God's character. Israel had reneged on its covenant with Jehovah, and the nation fell before the Philistines because it would not stand before the Lord God. The capture of the ark by the Philistines was in fact a triumph for Jehovah. For by it, he demonstrated his power and his glory to both the Israelites and the Philistines. Both nations showed contempt for Jehovah's holiness. And both nations were compelled by his response to recognize his self-sufficiency, his omnipotence, and his sovereignty. We should be compelled as well. You see, there is no refuge from God except the refuge that is in God. And that refuge came to die for us. Only the one who gave himself up for his all is able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and welcome us into his glory. And so just like the Protestants in England when threatened by the Spanish Armada, we marvel at the Lord's mighty power and at his willingness to intercede for us. We tremble at his vengeance against those who challenge him. And we rejoice in his grace that made our salvation a reality. To him be the glory. Amen. Father, we thank and praise you this morning for who you are. For your unchanging character. For revealing yourself to us through your word. Give us the desire to respond to your will. Give us, give us hearts that yearn for you. Make us mindful of your holiness and of your purity. For we desire to be Christ-like and pleasing in your sight. And we ask all these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. Hear the words of Jude, the brother of Jesus. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.